my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bruce Hungate. Uh, he received his bachelor's in music, English, and biology from Stanford, and then completed his PhD at UC Berkeley, and did postdocs at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center and Stanford. So he's currently a Regents Professor in the Department of Biosciences at Northern Arizona University, and the Director for the Center of Ecosystem Science and Society. And he's really well known um, and influential in the fields of ecosystem ecology and microbial ecology, and has done some really pioneering work on how um, anthropogenic drivers like climate change and nitrogen deposition influence ecosystem biogeochemistry. So um, before I invite him up, I'd just like to point out the evening social tonight will be at John Stark's house at 7.30 at 1281 Cliffside Drive. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Chris. Thanks. Thanks very much, Bonnie, and thanks to the students here for inviting me. It's always nice to get an invitation to give a talk, but it's especially nice when it comes from the graduate students. And I've really enjoyed my time here. You guys have a, a phenomenal thing going on here with ecology. I can't think of a seminar where I've seen this many people in the audience uh, for a talk like this. And um, the work is clearly top notch, so I've really enjoyed it so far. Um, this is beautiful, I think. I enjoyed uh, uh, hearing Al Gore give an entire talk, all with visuals of pictures of Earth from space. And this is one of uh, the favorites, of course. Here's another image of Earth. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, the title is Climate Change, What's New? And um, we'll, we'll go from uh, science, old science, and new science uh, answering uh, questions and raising new ones. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, work in my lab that's looking at feedbacks between the terrestrial biosphere and the climate system. And I want to um, spend a little bit of time thinking about our role as scientists interested in the science of climate change in the, the, the modern era. So um, one of the things that's new with climate change, the polls are showing about 75% of the US uh, population are, have some concern about climate change. Um, the other 25% are um, working for Congress or the federal <laughs> government. Um, but some of this interest is um, quantifiable. So this is a, a, a picture of Google searches for climate change. Um, the y-axis is immaterial, but the more searches, the higher it goes. And you, there is actually a general trend upward. And you can see some interesting patterns here. This is Copenhagen. Um, this is the, the Paris Agreement. Um, so, you know, there's some interest in climate change increasing over the years. It's um, somewhat less than other searches we might consider on the internet. This, when I first saw it, I couldn't believe it. I thought, that's the seasonal cycle of CO2. Look, you've got it going up in the winter when respiration's high, down in the summer when you've got more photosynthesis, but no. This is Google searches for the NFL, and this is actually games and the Super Bowl and then the draft. Yeah, so climate change is increasing in interest in the news, but it doesn't compete with some other things. Um, and, and the issue is it's not what captures the, the, the public interest, right? Part of this is our challenge in communicating the interest of science and its importance, because this is not just an important topic. It's also fascinating. What we're learning about the climate system from all the focus on the climate change challenge is really interesting stuff. And another challenge is a, a, an alternative information campaign, shall we say, that paints climate change in a very different way. So here are some quotes that I've gathered. It's a secret government plot concocted to justify implementation of a UN agenda to destroy excess wealth. It's a smokescreen for the intrusion of government by special interests that stand to gain financially, such as academia. I love that one. <laughs> And, of course, one we've all heard a lot. It's a plot by the Chinese in order to make U.S. manufacturing non-competitive. The truth about climate science lacks the intrigue these wacky ideas promise, and it also lacks their novelty. If we consider science in general as occupying the spectrum of excitement and likelihood of being true or plausibility, 
just for reference to orient you to this graph, most science would say their research falls about here, and they might describe the work of their colleagues here. Um, climate change science sits very high on both axes of excitement and plausibility. And it's been there for quite some time. So part of the uh, title of this talk is meant to be ironic. Actually, climate change is not a new science. And I'll give you just a very brief tour. I'm sure this is review for most of you. But I think, at least for me, it was worth putting this back together and remembering just what we're talking about when we're talking about climate change, uh, the theory of anthropogenic global warming and the greenhouse effect. They're mature ideas. We go back to Fourier, the same guy of the Fourier transform in mathematics. So what he did was he calculated Earth's expected temperature based on its distance from the sun and based on known radiation inputs and found that actually Earth is much warmer than it should be based on the radiation that we're receiving. Uh, and, and he postulated why isn't it... Uh, uh, colder than it is. And one of the ideas I love is that it's interstellar radiation, non-solar, you know, starlight. That must be warming up the Earth. Well, no, that one didn't pan out when he did the math. And so he postulated an atmospheric insulator and drew on some earlier experiments of de Saussure with model greenhouses. Um, and, and basically, the hypothesis of the greenhouse effect is born in 1820. Okay? And then we have... Um, Eunice Foote and John Tyndall, I could not find a photo or a, a, a drawing of Eunice Foote. She's a little bit uh, less known in the history. Uh, this would often skip to John Tyndall, but actually her work was earlier than his, and they were, as far as we can tell, independent. These were experiments that documented that the greenhouse gases, water vapor, CO2, methane, actually absorb infrared radiation, and that other gases like nitrogen and oxygen don't. These were empirical studies that showed that. And the, then the idea was uh, connected to uh, Fourier's idea that these must be the gases that are insulating uh, the Earth. So the, the, the theory uh, expands in that way. And you all know this, the, the, the basic idea of uh, the greenhouse theory of Earth's temperature. You have incident solar radiation. Some of it reflects back to space. The radiation warms the Earth. And that emits infrared radiation from the Earth's surface. Then we have our insulating atmospheric blanket that um, is made up of these greenhouse gases here, water vapor, methane, nitrous oxide, and CO2 that absorbs some of that uh, IR radiation uh, headed back out to space and re-radiate it back to the Earth. So that is the answer to Fourier's question. This is why the Earth is warmer than his calculations said it ought to be. Global warming. Of course, the anthropogenic uh, uh, th theory here expands this by recognizing that we're adding these gases to the atmosphere, basically thickening that blanket. And we give credit to Svant Arrhenius for this idea connecting the production of um, CO2 mostly is what uh, Svant Arrhenius focused on with the idea that that would warm the Earth. And it was connected with the burning of coal. It's wonderful to read his ideas, writings about this phenomenon when he was thinking about it because he says things like, this is great. We're going to make it warmer and this should be incentive to burn more coal. That's basically how you know, his, he announced uh, this theory, you know, how, how times have changed. Um, he showed or theorized really that having a few concentrations would cause an ice age. Doubling would increase temperatures by five to six degrees. His ideas included uh, things like ice albedo feedback. So we have the North Pole that's very reflective. As the Earth warms, the ice shrinks and the Earth absorbs more radiation. Um, and it included um, feedback from water vapor as well. So these are old ideas. So we've got the, the, the theory advanced in 1820. Um, connected to human activities at the end of the 19th century. It's around 1896. That means it's older than plate tectonics, older than endosymbiosis, older than a lot of theories in the sciences that were um, you know, relativity, Einstein stuff, um, that we're used to thinking of as well established. So this part of climate change is not new. Um, and of course, we have the, the famous Keeling curve in the 1950s. Scientists begin documenting carefully the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere in Mauna Loa. This is work of um, Charles Keeling. 
And these measurements have been replicated hundreds of observation stations around the world. And they show what I was referring to earlier, the breathing of the biosphere. So all these little peaks uh, are in the winter and the troughs are in the summer when respiration is maximal, when photosynthesis is maximal. I love showing my intro ecology course, this graph, and having them theorize. So what's causing the, the up and down? And the, the common answer is cycles of tourism. So they do get the idea that humans are producing CO2, um, but they're blown away by this notion that the breathing of the biosphere actually leaves this imprint on the concentrations of gas in the atmosphere. And that becomes powerful not just for um, its impact, but also for our ability to, to understand some of the mechanisms of um, why those CO2 concentrations change, partitioning things like the land and ocean sink. Some things we'll get into in, in just a little bit. So here's an article like many of you seen, uh, you know, the news of climate change. It's, um, uh, we still have the impression that maybe it was invented by Al Gore sometime after the internet. Um, and this article says pretty much everything that you've heard. You know, we're producing CO2, the glaciers are going to retreat, it's going to get warmer. The main difference about this one is that it was published in 1953. So really, even in the popular press, climate change has been getting a lot of attention. Of course, you all know it uh, is getting a lot now. The theory of human-caused climate change is mature, even old. There, of course, are important advances, refinements, errors, imperfections, and improvements, just as with any science. These bolster and test the basic theory, and our confidence in it increases the more we see that. Humans are changing the climate through burning fossil fuels. There are reams, tomes, volumes of evidence behind that simple statement. Um, as I said, this is probably review to all of you. And one of the things that I have been exploring is uh, some of the more nuanced understandings of climate change. Like a, bi a big question, actually, OK, climate's changing. Maybe it's because of greenhouse gases. But how do we know it's people? How do we know it's human emissions of greenhouse gases that are causing uh, the climate to change as we're seeing. And this gets into the fascinating scientific area of um, fingerprinting. Um, so the basic idea is many forces affect climate. How do we determine the influence of each? And there are lots of known uh, fingerprints in the, in the field. I'm just going to show you in a little bit of detail two of them. Um, the first is warming troposphere, cooling stratosphere. This is one where if you um, listen to the popular representation of climate science in the media, it's incredibly confusing how this one has been used and twisted uh, uh, to challenge the basic science. Because like all science, it is nuanced. So the idea here is that we've got uh, the, the atmospheric blanket of greenhouse gases, which is most concentrated, of course, in the troposphere. That's where most of the greenhouse effect occurs and most of the amplification of the greenhouse effect occurs. When you consider the radiation balance of the stratosphere, that warming effect is actually less. So actually you expect uh, tropospheric warming and stratospheric cooling with an accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And this has to do with exactly the concentration distribution and the re-radiation of infrared uh, back to the Earth's surface from the troposphere. So that's one of the theoretical predictions from all the models. They predict this. It's basic physics first principles. We can look for uh, fingerprints of that using um, a technique called uh, uh, data assimilation, mathematical modeling. Um, and the basic idea is there are other things that could cause changes in climate, like increased solar radiation or volcanic eruptions through sulfate aerosols. And these have very different expected impacts on that uh, distribution of um, temperature. So the mathematical models behind this are complicated. They do represent our best effort, our understanding of how these influence should operate uh, in isolation and together. And that's the main advantage of using data assimilation is you can say, well, I want to know what if it were just volcanoes? What if it were just the sun? What if it were just people? What if it were all the influences we could come up with? Um, let's use the models and, and figure that out. Um, it is kind of hard to explain, so let me give you an analogy. If we pretend we um, know the truth and it looks like this, 
Now let's pretend that we don't know the truth, but we have benchmarks based on data. An outstanding singer from blues to ballads, uh, holds microphone, makes loud sound while closing his eyes, has distinctive hair. And then we could imagine data that's estimating this truth, right? Um, we can gather data we think captures little bits of it, and then we build a model, and we get an estimate that's a reasonable facsimile. But what if we make some bad assumptions? And what if our data have noise? We forget some key component of the system, like forget the validation check about singing beautiful music, and we end up with a very <laughs> bad model and a different estimate of the truth. And part of the challenge in fingerprinting, of course, is to... Um, reject the bad models. In this case, we'd still pass many validation tech checks, like holds microphone, makes loud sounds while closing eyes, has distinctive hair, but we miss the beautiful singing, right? So the challenge in fingerprinting, again, is to reject the bad models and uh, to find the good ones. Sorry, it's a little early for this, but it was funnier a couple weeks ago. Um, so for uh, tropospheric warming and stratospheric cooling, what we use are combinations of radiosondes and satellites. The radiosondes are those weather balloons that sample the atmosphere as they float up, and the satellites get different pictures of the, 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 the spectral properties of the atmosphere that can be related to temperature. So here's the model, and what the model says uh, this temperature distribution should look like if it's solar forcing. Here is what it looks like if it's the, the human, uh, plus all the natural forcings. Um, so that includes the influence of greenhouse gases. So both of these are uh, ensemble of model projections. They're all the different models that take into account the physics, and they say, OK, what should the distribution of temperature look like between the troposphere and stratosphere. And then we compare it with the radiosonde data, which look like that. So you can see it maps much better onto the human plus natural than it does onto the pure natural, and especially up in the stratosphere, where you, there actually is a, a cooling signal. So this is an example of fingerprinting, where we can say, actually, volcanic aerosols, they don't make sense. Um, the solar forcing doesn't make sense. These other mechanisms that could force the climate don't add up and they don't explain our data. Another example of fingerprinting, and the last one I'll show you in detail, is the, the CS2 signature in surface radiation. This one to me is fascinating. It's a lot newer, um, and, and there was a, a, an important paper on it last year that really went into depth. The idea is that you've got this um, spectrum of greenhouse gas radiation where we know where individual gases fall uh, in terms of their, um, their spectral signature and how they're absorbing and, and emitting uh, uh, infrared radiation. So we have a, a particular signature in the spectrum for each of these gases these, are, of course, are determined in isolation, in the laboratory, in controlled experiments. And the, the challenge in trying to find this in nature is there's a huge signal-to-noise problem. So especially if you think of the magnitude of the expected forcing from greenhouse gas concentrations, it's pretty small against the background radiation. And the reason it has an effect is it's cumulative. Um, so one of the ways this is approached is through these um, Department of Energy facilities. There's one in Alaska, shown here, and there's one in Oklahoma. These are the atmospheric radiation monitors. They're super sensitive radiation meters that look at incoming radiation from the sky in all the different wavelengths. And, um, and the, the, the pattern of, of re-radiated, uh, uh, the spectral signal of what's re-radiated as well. So one of the things they show with an infrared gas analyzer that's next to this instrument is the typical pattern of uh, CO2 concentration over time. There it is. So that's shown on, on this axis here, and you see the seasonal cycles. CO2 is going up and down, and it's um, just like what we see with the Mauna Loa curve, right? Then what they do is look for the spectral signer, signature of um, CO2 in atmospheric radiation, and they filter out all the other noise. So they say, given that CO2 is changing in these concentrations, what do we expect to see in terms of radiation? 
And then they looked for that in the signal and they found pretty much a perfect match. So this to me was really elegant demonstration that our theory is right. As CO2 is going up, we're seeing more infrared radiation being absorbed by just as theory predicts. This is the first time I'm aware that this has been done um, in, in nature and it's a strong fingerprint that connects change in radiation balance to change in CO2 concentrations um, caused by burning fossil fuels. So there are lots of other fingerprints. There are just 10 others listed here, and that is just a start. So um, together, these constitute the smoking gun that says, look, we have accumulated lots of independent lines of evidence that say this is really happening. Um, some examples, there actually is uh, reduced oxygen in the atmosphere over time. It's nothing to worry about in terms of supporting aerobic life because it's really tiny change, but we can detect it. And it actually adds up really well with uh, combustion. So we, we know that when you combust organic matter, oxygen is consumed, and we actually see that stoichiometry represented in the atmosphere. What are other fun examples? I like that one in particular. Of course, the um, 3 billion tons of CO2 per year uh, produced through fossil fuel burning. And this is verified in, in, in many ways, uh, independently through economic records, through sales of oil and gas, um, and also biogeochemically, because that carbon is really, really old, on average about 90 million years old, and so it has very little carbon-14, effectively no detectable carbon-14 in it, and indeed we've seen a decline, a steady decline in the C14 content of the atmosphere, another independent uh, tracer that this is not uh, 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 something else, it's, it's human uh, emitted fossil fuel burning. <coughs> Top of the atmosphere radiation is another one um, where we see that same uh, type of uh, spectral signature uh, at the top of the atmosphere that we expect from the accumulation of greenhouse gases. So there are lots of different independent uh, lines of evidence pointing to the human uh, uh, cause of climate change, ongoing climate change, and of course this is still a continuing area of, of active research. My particular field, though, is more about um, impacts on the biosphere on those changing greenhouse gas concentrations. So given that we have uh, CO2 going up in the atmosphere, temperature increasing, precipitation changing, how do ecosystems respond to these changes and feedback to affect the climate? It turns out that this is a large unknown in our ability to anticipate future climate. We estimate it's about 30% of, of the unknown are uh, these biospheric feedbacks. How big will they be? Some of them are positive or destabilizing feedbacks. If you get a little climate change, the feedback kicks in and gives you more climate change. Some of them are negative or stabilizing feedbacks, meaning that if you bump the climate one way, the feedback kicks in and pulls the climate back down. Um, one of the most uh, one of the largest and most hoped for of those feedbacks is the idea that as CO2 increases in the atmosphere, photosynthesis should increase and plant growth should increase, and that should store more carbon in plants and in soils. Um, this is something that's actively debated and discussed and, and is the first place that we'll start today uh, in, in, in this part of the talk. So here's an influential paper that said that, yes, indeed, rising CO2 will increase plant growth, and it will increase the amount of carbon that plants store, and the increase in plant growth is about 25%, and it's conserved across many different ecosystems. And here is the data that supported that claim. So this is net primary productivity, or plant growth. Uh, the little C here means control conditions, and you can see the units from half a kilo to 2.5 kilos 
uh, per meter squared. That should actually have a, a per year on it too. And then here is the same thing in the elevated CO2 plots. So here's the plant growth you get with extra CO2 compared to the plant growth you get with ambient CO2. The dotted line here is the one-to-one. -one. And you, so you can see for all these experiments, they're pushed up above that one-to-one -one line just as the plant physiologists tell us they should be and about a 25% or so increase in uh, plant growth. So that sounds great. That's a good portion of our climate change problem uh, cleaned up for us by plants because plant photosynthesis is a huge flux, about uh, 60 petagrams of carbon per year uh, compared to around 12 that we emit to the atmosphere uh, through fossil fuel burning. So if that's true and constant and global, um, it's around a third of our problem cleaned up for us by plants. Go plants. But then there are exceptions. I mean, first one, in the desert, there's no response in, in the desert. Um, here's another one in uh, uh, Minnesota grasslands where nitrogen played a strong role in reducing uh, that expected response. And here actually is one of the forests that was included in that uh, paper. They included data from, I think, 2002, 2003, right before this decline in productivity occurred. So this is time in this Oak Ridge face experiment. Here's um, net primary productivity. Same thing as before. And you can see the green with the high CO2 or the face treatment is much, much higher than the low. But as you go over time, they tend to converge. And what Norby and colleagues think is going on is that over time, the system's running out of nitrogen and it's unable to support that higher growth response because of that nutrient constraint. So the convergence might not be so general after all. And I want to dig into this a little bit with one example of an experiment I've been involved with uh, for many years. And this is an experiment in Florida. This is a scrub oak ecosystem. Here's a cartoon drawing of it. It's a, a spotosol. You can see the, the three meter horizon. And this is about where the water table sits. The oak roots actually get, get down into that horizon. And these below ground structures are probably 100, 150 years old. The above ground structures don't get much more than 15 years old because fire comes through, wipes away the above ground vegetation, and then you get another cycle uh, of, of regrowth and disturbance. And what we did in this case was we started the experiment right after fire with the idea we wanted to capture an entire cycle of uh, uh, vegetation recovery after disturbance. The way we manipulated CO2 concentrations is with open top chambers. So these are chambers just like their name says. They're actually open to the top. You see this little frustum here that's um, slowing down the escape of gas. That's to try to help us use a little less CO2. But other than that, the chamber's open at the top receiving ambient precipitation with a little bit less from the frustrum. Um, these fans blow either normal air into the chamber or air with an extra drip of CO2 that simulates an atmosphere um, around 2050 to 2080, really, depending on what we decide to do with fossil fuels between now and then. Here is the uh, cycle, the, the full data set from this experiment for net primary productivity. You can see the elevated CO2 in white symbols, the ambient in black. This is NPP in grams per meter squared per year. This is grams of biomass, so divide by two for grams of carbon, and, and this is time. So some of the main features you can see here is that there are definitely some years where we had a, a large biomass stimulation, but there are other years where we didn't. Um, these years where we did have a large biomass stimulation were large enough that on average we actually got pretty close to 25%. You know, the magical convergence number that Rich Norby and colleagues postulated was where all ecosystems sit. But of course, far more impressive here is the range. So what's going on with that range? Well, we had a fire at the very beginning of our experiment. And this is Florida, subtropical Florida. This is actually right on the Kennedy Space Center. We could see shuttle launches from the site. It was pretty cool. Um, and we had a, a, a hurricane in late 2004. So two major disturbances. And if you notice the timing of those disturbances with the timing of the largest increases in plant growth, 
you start to see a pattern. So fire, large response. Hurricane, large response. Dissipates over time. We can graph the data again this way. Instead of just year AD, we now have years since disturbance. And you can see after the fire, there's a, a delay, a peak, and then a decline. And same thing with the hurricane. Delay, a peak, and then a decline. So what might be going on here? One of the ideas is that disturbance resets biogeochemical cycles as well. And one of the things you see after a disturbance like fire often is an increase in soil nutrient availability. And we saw that for nitrogen, for phosphorus, and for trace elements. We saw after fire the um, uh, availability of those elements were, was, was higher. And that, for the reason I mentioned before, remember the... Um, Oak Ridge case and the Minnesota case, where the CO2 responses of those systems were smaller, <coughs> excuse me, because of lack of nitrogen. That might be what's going on here as well. So we saw that CO2 increases NPP, but the average was less impressive than the range. And we also see that there's this major modulation by ecological disturbance. And this, I think, is important because the models that try to project uh, the carbon cycle on the global scale don't take into account uh, uh, disturbance in this way, um, and, or the, the, the dependence of the CO2 response on disturbance. And I suspect if nutrients are the driver of the response we saw, that it's probably pretty general that it's something you'll see in many other ecosystems that have these cycles of disturbance and regeneration, which seems like pretty much all of them, you know, at least on some time scale, right? So ecosystem responses to elevated CO2 are quite variable in terms of, of plant growth. And one of the things we've explored in my group is to uh, uh, try to see what are some of those key controllers. We've had many dozens of experiments around the world now that have looked at CO2 responses uh, in terms of biomass, and we can use techniques like meta-analysis to try to figure out what are the most important uh, drivers of that CO2 response. And one of our most recent efforts in this looked at a number of things, um, but we identified nitrogen availability, which wasn't terribly surprising for the reason I just mentioned, but also mycorrhizal type as a key determinant of the CO2 response. That third one there, delta CO2, that just means in a given experiment, by how much did it increase CO2? It turned out that was an important predictor, but that's pretty much expected. You'd expect a bigger response if you go up 300 parts per million than if you just go up 100 parts per million. So it's really those top two that were the most interesting. Other factors uh, did not seem to have as much of an influence, including things that surprised me, like duration of the experiment and, and vegetation age. Um, so this is a, a new approach in meta-analysis to use a model selection procedure and try to figure out, OK, in, across my data set, which are the most important drivers? And it identified these three. So what did the data look like? What did that? Oops, I thought I was getting to the data, but let's talk about mechanisms first. So this is a drawing of the two different major types of mycorrhizae. On the upper left here, you see arbuscular mycorrhizae that often associate with grasses. And these are mycorrhizae that actually infiltrate the cell itself, and that's where the exchange of carbon and nutrients happen. The basic story of mycorrhizae is it's a symbiosis, a mutualism where both partners benefit. The, the fungus gets carbon from the plant through photosynthesis, and the plants get nutrients from the fungus. But there are differences between the arbuscular, which I just, just described, and the ectomycorrhizal here, uh, which is blown up because it was the really important player in our story. And one of the big differences is that these ectomycorrhizal fungi are much better at harvesting nitrogen from the soil. So with that hint, you might be able to anticipate where the, the, the data are going to point. And that's shown here. If we just look at our buscular mycorrhizae, we see what we might expect. Under low nitrogen conditions, there's not much biomass response to CO2. But under high nitrogen conditions, we get about a 20% response, a significant increase. With the ectos, though, we saw a really different pattern. We saw that they could respond to high CO2 even if nitrogen was not supplied um, through fertilizer. 
And we think the reason is what I just hinted at, that the fungi are actually able to scavenge nitrogen they need from the soil. And so the mutualism basically turns up when we give it high CO2 and the plants are able to get the nitrogen that they need. So I think that's cool. I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical that it will persist indefinitely into the future, but clearly the ectomycorrhizal plants have a benefit and this is something that we think um, the Earth System modelers should also include. I don't know how many of you have been up on this, um, but in the last, I don't know, 10 to 15 years, there have been all these calls from microbial ecologists. You have to put microbes in models. And here's my NMDS plot to prove it. And the modelers are like, no, I can't really use an ordination plot to model an ecological process. But we think with data like these and with the ability to predict the distribution of mycorrhizae, it's, it's pretty well known which plants associate with which fungi. This might be a good way to start. So there's another part of this story um, about the expected uh, carbon sink caused by elevated CO2, which really connects this final um, arrow to soil. So uh, CO2 increases photosynthesis. It often increases plant growth. Will that cause an increase in soil carbon? This is important because soil is a huge reservoir of carbon, and if that's true, that will help ameliorate rising CO2 as well. And it turns out that lots of models have this expectation. Here's a somewhat dated one that says that of all the CO2 that humans emit, we expect anywhere from 22% to 60% are going to be taken up by ecosystems, and about half of that in soil. I mean, that's a huge subsidy. This is the CO2 only run, so it includes no uh, warming. But still, that's a huge effect. If that's true, really, that's great news. Um, and here's a more recent uh, look at the same thing uh, just, just out a few months ago, where the CO2 only model runs are projecting a four petagram per year carbon sink. Our missing sink right now is on the order of two to two and a half petagrams of carbon. So this is more than explaining the missing sink. We have a missing source problem if this model is right. These models, both the, those from 2001 and this one from 2016, uh, don't account for nitrogen and they don't account for um, some of the biogeochemical dynamics that I'll get into uh, now. So one of the things we did is to challenge these models with data from experiments. Because if the models are right, then the experiments should show increasing soil carbon. What we found in this meta-analysis was that across all the CO2 experiments conducted to date, uh, there was increased soil carbon with elevated CO2, but it only happened in um, ecosystems that received exogenous nitrogen. In the case of low nitrogen or natural ecosystems or most of the terrestrial surface, we found no evidence uh, 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 that CO2 increased soil carbon. So this is a synthesis of around um, 80, I think it was 83 different uh, experiments around the world. When we also looked at those model projections with simple stoichiometric constraints and asked, is there enough nitrogen to support how much carbon uptake these models are projecting? We found, no, there's not. We added up nitrogen from deposition, from likely fixation, from increased efficiency of nitrogen use, and this is about what we came up with. If these are nitrogen supply limits, a low range and a high range, and then this is additional carbon uh, that's stored. All these letters is a different model run. So all of these models are uh, require in reality a lot of nitrogen, but the models don't include nitrogen cycle in them, so they don't need to find the nitrogen. And we're saying, hey, that's not very realistic. It's worse for phosphorus. <laughs> and this is something we pointed out in 2003. There has been increased interest in adding nitrogen and biogeochemistry to these models, but it's still at a very early stage, and you still see a lot of carbon-only models uh, run, um, ostensibly predicting our future carbon cycle. So back to the meta-analysis, where we saw no increase in soil carbon at low nitrogen. There are two possible reasons we might see that. One is a power problem. 
maybe our experiments haven't lasted long enough. After all, soil is a long-lived, slowly turning over <laughs> pool. It needs time in order to accumulate carbon. Uh, the other explanation is that something else is going on such that ev we might expect an increase in soil carbon given what we've seen with plant growth, but something microbial is canceling it out. So we used our own um, data assimilation approach to get at this, basically building a model of, of soil carbon and asking or confronting that model with the data. So we put together all our lines of evidence through data and use them to inform this model, really focusing on these K coefficients, which really are the rate of decomposition of soil carbon and its return back to the atmosphere as CO2. They're super hard to measure. You can't really go to an ecosystem and measure its K. Uh, if you measure CO2 flux, there are too many things contributing. If you measure litter decomposition, that's really just the entry point. Um, of, of, of soil carbon and getting that turnover of soil is really hard. So this is the approach we use, basically looking at it uh, through inverse modeling. The simple model we use to describe a pool has carbon at time t as a function of carbon at time zero that decays, and then you add net primary productivity to that carbon, which also decays. That's basically, in words, what this equation says. And the, the yellow K is really what we're trying to estimate. The I, we have a good measure of. C0 and CT, we also have a good measure of. And there were some other data streams we put into this, but this is the basic idea. What we found is, first of all, no surprise, CO2 increases plant growth. That's what that means. But it also increases K. The only way we can explain our soil carbon data, given what we saw uh, plant responses, is we have to turn out microbial decomposition. So there's a compensation in microbes to that increase in plant growth that um, basically for this model run erases the carbon sink. This would be equilibrium soil carbon, and it's basically showing no change. So this is the case for ecosystems in which um, nitrogen is not added um, uh, for the most part. And it's these kind of dynamics that the Earth system models don't include. They don't include a dynamic K coefficient, they assume that's constant. There are also some other feedbacks that were lobbying based on meta-analysis to get included, like feedbacks from nitrous oxide and methane. It turns out that when you increase CO2 concentrations around vegetation, N2O flux goes up, and so does methane. Um, and it's substantial. Here it is expressed as uh, CO2 equivalents uh, per year. Um, the methane story is interesting when we look at rice because rice is a major source of this greenhouse gas. Here you can see the effect of CO2 on methane emissions. Um, here's the effect of temperature. And here's the effect of CO2 on yield. So one argument has come up that, well, maybe, yeah, we'll have more increased greenhouse gases from agriculture. But if we can compensate that with increased yield, maybe economically we'll be OK. Um, so we looked at yield-scaled emissions, and actually with um, CO2, they're still higher. With temperature, they're really quite a bit higher because uh, temperature depresses yield. So even if you scale them for uh, yield, it's not such a great story. It looks like this, right? This is CO2, and here's methane coming out after we add CO2 to, to rice. And of course, these are um, archaea, methanogens, that. Uh, eat the extra sugars that the rice plant makes and convert them into uh, methane. But another twist on this was especially interesting because we looked at what about these high yielding cultivars that are um, promising in terms of feeding the world more efficiently, or the world that relies on rice anyway, what's their impact on methane emissions? And we found a really interesting pattern here. Um, if you look at the low carbon soil, this is rice plant productivity, and this is methane emissions over the time course of the experiment. And just focus, let's see, on the grain yield line, where they're all going the same direction. As rice productivity goes up, so does methane emissions. And that's consistent with what we said before, because productivity is more carbon input to soil feeding those methanogens. But we found exactly the opposite in these high carbon soils, that when productivity went up, methane emissions actually went down. So when we dug into this and figured out what was going on, it turns out that that higher productivity aerates the soil because the roots grow more. 
And there's so much carbon in those soils that adding that oxygen actually stimulates methane eaters. So the more yield you get, the less methane emissions you get. And this was encouraging after all the bad news slides I just showed you that maybe you know, food security and climate change mitigation uh, could go hand in hand. And of course, that effect was much, much smaller if we shrink the axis scales. I don't know if you noticed that one went up to 0 0.03. So it's much, much smaller. This is the bigger deal. This is just a, um, an artist's rendition of um, what I think summarizes most of our findings, is that even though more CO2 in the atmosphere means more plant growth, which stores some carbon that we might hope is locked away, there's also these other feedback <coughs> through other gases that we need to consider. With the development of carbon markets, um, the interest in biodiversity, there's the potential for all of this to become um, synergetic, synergistic and really multi Faceted. And I'll just give you one brief example of something we're working on in this way. This looks at the marginal carbon storage caused by increasing biodiversity. So what this graph shows is if I go from a species richness of three to four, I add uh, about five, what is that? metric tons of carbon per hectare. If I go from two to three, I add a lot more. So this is marginal. It doesn't mean carbon is going down. It's the increment added from each extra species. If you did the cumulative, it would basically look like the, you know, the sum of, of, of the area under the curve. So because there's a carbon market now, there are you know, 40 different major um, political entities that implement carbon trading schemes. <laughs> We've estimated the social cost of carbon many, many ways. We can actually convert this axis to dollars. It's a little scary for me to do this, and I don't really like it, but I'll show you anyway, to estimate the value of species richness. So there's a lot of talk about the value of biodiversity and how important it is for ecosystem services. We took that to estimate, um, or as a challenge to estimate a production function, when you add extra species to an ecosystem, what kind of extra value are you getting? And if you're on the scale of a hectare, it's not terribly impressive. But if you think of the ranges of species or large scale conservation programs, then you can easily get up into the hundreds of millions of dollars because this is a widespread uh, distributed ecosystem service. And the bottom line is more diversity, more value. So in the first two parts of this talk, or the first, very first part, I showed you the fingerprint evidence for the human imprint on climate. It's overwhelming. In the second, I showed you some of this, our scientific efforts to understand feedbacks of the terrestrial biosphere um, to the changing climate. This is clearly an area of active research. And one of the things I reflect on is in that second, the uncertainty is a lot larger. And to me, there are really exciting, interesting, fun and important scientific debates. And there's a mismatch uh, between that and the public perception of where the uncertainty lies. And that's one of the places where I see our challenge as scientists in, in communicating. And this comic to me says it all. The person's a denier, Godzilla's climate change. And of course, the, the, the climate isn't settled. That's a silly thing to say about any science, whether it's relativity or gravity or climate change. Um, but what's bewildering to me about the extremely vocal movement taking pot shots at climate science is that it's not serious science. They're old, repackaged, regurgitated arguments that are red herrings or infrared herrings, if you will. Um, uh, and and it's, it's really confusing to a public that isn't an, an expert. Some of the things I watch for, and I just want to spend a few minutes talking about now, is that there have been some really interesting developments um, in this area involving public challenges, court cases, um, uh, uh, aspersions of conspiracies and all that. And they really begin with this. Does everybody recognize this? Yeah. What is it? Well, it, does, it doesn't really look like a hockey stick, but this is the hockey stick, right? Um, and so this is work of um, Mann, Bradley, and Hughes in 1999. Uh, data from thermometers, from tree rings, all kinds of reconstructions. And I'm sure you've heard of the hockey stick and all the controversy it's uh, inspired. And here's just one little snippet of some of that controversy. <laughs> 
The first one here was published on the website of the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Uh, the second is from Mark Stein, who's a blogger. And I highlight the key phrases they used that inspired Michael Mann to sue for defamation. Um, so we're all, sorry, that's supposed to be under fraudulent. We're all allowed to criticize science, right? And that's really important. I actually have a um, colleague in my lab, Paul Dykstra. Every time I open my mouth and say something, he says, you're wrong. And usually it elevates from there, but it's kind of become his role that, you know, of course we're supposed to challenge each other, but this is different. This is a, a, a factually based accusation, right? That there was fraud involved. And that's where Michael Mann's uh, suit becomes interesting. So this is going on now. Uh, Mike, Mark Stein is the main defendant. It's really been dragged on for a long time. I keep waiting for an update, but um, the court is uh, uh, deciding uh, the, the next procedural step. Um, I find it really interesting. And because it's an issue of freedom of speech on the one hand, and a lot of free speech advocates are backing up Stein, saying he's absolutely allowed to say these things. They're journalistic hyperbole, which should be protected free speech, versus man who says, no, 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 look, this is my reputation. This is my credibility as a scientist that's being challenged. They're factual. We have tested them, and, and, and I didn't commit fraud. Um, right now, you know, the science is very strongly behind man. I like to say we have enough hockey sticks to field a team. It's actually not my original, but um, there's another one here. Uh, Andrew Weaver, um, I, I had to show this quote again, should be made to repay his research money, lose his tenure. A few centuries in jail would give him time to reflect on the biggest fraud in the history of mankind. A lot of that is protected. I think you could probably call him a hypocrite. It's not really falsifiable, I don't know. But uh, lies and deception and fraud, those are actionable. And this actually uh, made it to a decision where the uh, plaintiff won a whopping $50,000. Of course, the post, the defendant in the suit immediately appealed. And that appeal is still pending today. I see these as really interesting case studies in uh, you know, the scientific enterprise, freedom of the press, freedom of speech. And where are the lines between them? So I'm watching these cases with interest. I'm also watching uh, this one, uh, where Lamar Smith, who's head of the House uh, Science Committee, um, accused NOAA scientists of doctoring data and um, have issued subpoenas to NOAA for all the correspondence um, that might be related to this case. NOAA has released all the data. They've released all the methods. They've said, we'll come and explain to you exactly what we did, and, and they've tried. But the, the subpoena is targeting uh, communications, I think, in a fishing expedition for much like what happened um, in the uh, East Anglia um, climate gate thing. So the, um, the, the subpoenas have expanded uh, to attorney generals and you, groups like the Union of Concerned Scientists, where the, Lamar Smith is asking for all their uh, communication. And the attorney generals of New York and Massachusetts are refusing because they, they say it's completely irrelevant. The House has no grounds to uh, legally request these documents. Um, and by the way, they're protected for freedom of speech and they're not about science. Um, so this is really interesting. Um, constitutional scholars weigh in as well. The NOAA debate is uh, about this. This was a paper last year where the blue line shows the original temperature reconstruction and the black line shows the corrected one. And this was because we realized right here we changed the way that sea surface temperatures were measured by ships. They used to stick a bucket out in the water and then they used water from the engine's intake. Someone documented actually those are really different and we need to account for that. That's how science works, right? We recognize errors, we do our best to fix them. It's interesting to me that one of the consequences of that is that we now project from this reconstruction uh, less warming over the last uh, century or so. But what it also did statistically is it removed what people were causing the pause. I've never really been able to see the pause, but I guess if you start right there, that's what we do. We start right there in 1997. That's baseline, not much warming. That's basically the argument of the climate skeptics, that there's been a recent pause. And, and this paper debunked it. That made Lamar Smith really mad. So he subpoenaed the, the communication. And meanwhile, there's growing scrutiny in the fossil fuel industry um, with ExxonMobil. 
Um, I just saw this this morning that, um, well, the ExxonMobil investigation's been going on for a while. That's attorney generals in Massachusetts and New York looking into whether ExxonMobil deliberately misled its shareholders about the risk of climate change because they had some top-notch climate scientists in the early 70s working on all this stuff and trying to figure it out, and they suppressed that evidence. So the argument goes. Um, just this morning, I saw this, which, you know, this is one of the things I really wonder what's going to happen with Paris with uh, the election last week. During the campaign, um, President-elect Trump said he would get rid of it. Um, when you look into the mechanisms to do that, there are clearly ways he can do that. Uh, one, he could drop out of the 1992 um, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Treaty. Um, that would probably cause a lot of backlash. Um, he could also just not do anything about the treaty, but sort of phase out all the efforts to implement the, the effects. Because like most international treaties, there's not much teeth here. It's a, basically a global agreement to cooperate to address, uh, address a, big, a big problem. Um, same thing. I guess I got that twice. And this is basically what I feel like uh, scientists often do uh, in talking about uh, climate change and its problems. And one of the things I've been thinking about more is how we can tap into um, the ways we communicate, the ways we talk about our, our research and our science to uh, really confront its implications for our, our society. So I want to move beyond uh, this example of harvesting the wind. Thank you for your attention. Sorry, I went on a little bit there. <laughs> Questions? Somebody must have won. They get photosynthate, they get sugar, they get carbon fixed from the atmosphere, they get food. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so speaking of the election, are you going to be out of the job in a few moments and relying on federal funding here? Great question. Who knows, right? I mean, I think that there's um, lots of hyperbole during campaigns. And the, the, the tricky thing about this one is it's really hard to know what to expect. Um, I think some of our programs are in the crosshairs for sure, you know. Um, but you never know. Tomorrow I'll give a really different talk, and I am trying to um, diversify, and maybe that's an adaptive strategy. <laughs> but I do think, you know, the, the sad thing about that statement, even though it's kind of funny, is that actually means, could mean fewer people thinking about what are actually really important problems. And, so I want to also resist that uh, fallback. Yeah. So Bruce, there's, with ecologists, there's this huge controversy, I think, regarding how much should we be just objective scientists and how much should we be advocates for yeah. um, applying the results that we produce. Right. Where do you come down on that? Well, I'm, I'm definitely of the opinion that um, there are obligations that scientists hold to taxpayers that are on both sides of that uh, uh, line. Um, we're obligated, for example, to d deposit our data in a way that's permanently archived and, and accessible to future scientists. Um, but we're also obligated to communicate the content of the science and, I think, the implications. So. I think the, 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 that obligation to me is clear. Where I uh, think there's more room is um, how you choose to do that and, and you know, where your comfort level is and, and um, where your skill set is. Um, though at the same time, I, I say that, I think one of the obligations for me is to get out of my comfort zone and try to do more of what I think I ought. Um, the, the big challenge with walking on both sides of that line is that you fear losing credibility. But I think there are ways to do that 
where you say, you know, look, here's my science. Here's what I think it means, you know, like the mycorrhizae thing with CO2. I could probably describe that in a way that's fairly politically neutral, right? It's, I mean, it's just a really cool result. But then, you know, I say, actually, uh, let's step over on this side and talk about all those meta-analyses. They look like nature's not going to clean up our climate change mess for us. We should probably focus on emissions. Of course, I'm speaking as a citizen now, interpreting science in light of my uh, views of what's an appropriate solution to this problem. So I think if we're careful to say, I'm speaking as a scientist here, and I've actually um, seen people being coached to use this trick, and now I'm going to speak as a citizen. You, know, you take a step to the side, and you're from a different perspective. Because really, that's the, the line we're trying to walk. So, yeah, Peter. I was going to ask you the same question. Yeah. Yeah, the policy prescriptions, that's right, that's right. A body of scientific information. Right. And what I think is a much different calculation if the science is actually not being represented yes. correctly. Yes, that's right. And in fact, being purposely, intentionally misrepresented. You're right. And I think there, it seems to be totally appropriate for a scientist to say, well, whoa, 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 that is not Absolutely, correct. right. If you, if you guys uh, don't want to do anything Right. What's going to happen? No, it reminds me of Steven Schneider in one of the examples he would give. He would say, as a scientist, I can tell you, if you step out of a window on a 20-story building, what's going to happen? <laughs> uh, don't ask me if you should or not. That's, that's a, a value judgment. But I will tell you what will happen. Yeah. And you know, I think that kind of speaks to your point, which is a good one. So there are, yeah, it's really important to think about that and, and, and to find a, a place that is uh, honest. Yeah. Um, when when showing us all those graphs and everything, I saw that as, as you went back many times in, in the winter, you know, the you know, <coughs> peak. And so if, if there was some way to manage it during those winter months, like, do you think that would really help? As in, just to keep it a, like maybe just a consistent like yeah. curve upwards from right. these peaks and these falls, you know? Right. Yeah, I think not really. When you, when you look uh, and blow up that curve and look at the peaks, they're big, right? But when you look at the whole Mauna Loa curve, they're a little tiny. And, and so if your interest is in uh, the, the total radiative forcing, just um, flattening out the winter peaks would not do much. Yeah, unfortunately. I mean, if, if there were... Uh, a CO2 sequestration strategy that focused on those winter months, maybe it was concentration dependent in a phenomenal way, and could lock that carbon away, then sure. But by itself, just chopping off the peaks in winter wouldn't do much. Yeah. Hey guys,